How are you doing? Good. I had a good day yesterday. I was at Road America testing a Porsche GT2 and GT3. Wow. How's that for a day at the office? Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> You are you a collector at all? You no. like fast cars? No, I spend all my money on, on, that, on that thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, when you're in New Yorkers, yeah, yeah hey, no. cars are a pain, yeah. right? That'd it's be, like another that'd mortgage. Be, that'd be good for New York, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a good looking thing. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Hi, Auto Line After Hours. How you doing? Pretty good. So let's see, last week we were in New York. Right. And the week before that, you weren't here. I was out of the country, I think. You were somewhere. Somewhere. And, uh, but here we are. Europe. We're, we're here. Yeah. It's good. And that voice you just heard is Henry Payne. He's back. <laughs> good to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. And tell everybody what you were doing yesterday. I was a uh, good day at the office. I was uh, testing a uh, Porsche GT2 uh, and a Porsche GT3 RS at Road America in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. Yeah. 155 miles an hour down the main straight. How much? 155, 150. which was speed limited. It'll actually hit 180 yeah. on the on the main straight. <laughs> and and so, how fast were you on 696 coming here to the studio today? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. yeah. When I when I when I come come back to the real world, I go to adaptive cruise control. Just yeah. so I don't wind up <laughs> in jail. Yeah. Yeah. Same here, Henry. It's That's the, the only way I can stay it's uh, a with a tough transition, John. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Hey, but we got to let everybody know our special guest for today's show is Robert Bollinger who's come up with this incredible electric truck we want to talk about. But Robert, welcome to AutoLine After Hours. Thanks for having me on. This is great. And I want to say that, too, because I've been calling you and your company Bollinger, but you corrected me. No, it's Bollinger. Yeah, you can say it many different ways, but my family goes by Bollinger, yeah. Okay, cool. So what prompted you to say the world needs an electric truck and I'm going to do it? Uh, this came out of a, a few years ago, living upstate New York in Catskills, had a farm, a uh, grass-fed cattle farm, and uh, I was wanting to go back to childhood dream of starting something, doing something automotive, and so uh, was up there and hired uh, Carl Hacken was our first employee, chief engineer, and then uh, CJ and John came on, and so we were researching and such, and we're like, what do we want to do with electric and we were like well we need a truck i need a truck on the farm so it was totally out of necessity and need and just what i wanted to drive but you're not a car guy i mean like in the classic right. sense of right i went to school for industrial design to be a car guy and oh, it just okay. never happened until yeah childhood dream so yeah you're going back 30s. to your roots yeah yeah mm -hmm. but and you have what an industrial uh uh design degree from carnegie mellon yeah so i went there uh uh, it, to become a car stylist and get into the car design and all that kind of stuff. But uh, when I said I wanted to do that industrial design program, they're like, oh, we don't do that, you know, kind of thing. So I learned design a little bit differently. If, I guess you would say it was less styling and more how things are made and, and, and why you make it the way you would make it. Mm -hmm. So it was a great education. It was perfect for making a big square truck. <laughs> so. I'm sure there's a method to the madness, too. Uh, my guess is you went with these square forms. You don't need stamping dies to make this, right? Right, right. You, you just fabricate it. Correct. We wanted to make it all in the shop that we had in upstate New York where that was made. So uh, when I first found out that like dies could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and take 18 months to be made for you, I was like, well, that's not going to work. And this kind of look is and those are cheap dies, by yeah, the way. Yeah, exactly. That was back Full mass years. production mm -hmm. dies, you're talking right. double-digit millions. Yeah, those are just prototype dies, exactly. So, um, yeah, we just wanted to make it ourselves, so get a press break and that kind of thing. So um, when we were designing in CAD and on paper and stuff like that, uh, the old Broncos, the old, you know, that whole school of design is what I love the most. So 
uh, I was just basically the truck was completely made out of what we wanted to make it, hmm. and that was that. So we didn't have focus groups or accountants. Um, That's how the best products in this industry yeah. have always been made. So now we the have icon 8, 000, products yeah. and the purchasers, and we have to you know keep working on the cost. So, so what was the rationalization for going electric? Uh, it was just not even a decision, really. It was just like it obviously was to go electric when I started this because this was, you know, 2015, just mm -hmm. not that long ago, right? And I thought anyone starting anything now in automotive, it's got to be electric. And it just kind of was just an obvious choice at the time. And once I got to learn more and more about electric and what it can do for you and the way it gave us the architecture of the truck that's very unique, it just is so much better for trucks than gasoline and diesel mm -hmm. anyway. So. Um, we like to think that the truck has like a number of great features about it that are make it better than any truck that's on the road and one of them is that it's electric. Mm -hmm. so. What are the others? The others is the pass-through that's um, in the middle of the truck because the motors are below the floor plan. She has a good picture of it. Yeah, so that's on my f farm up in upstate New York. And uh, so that pass-through, the uh, lockable storage space in the front, you know, because you can take off the glass, you can take off the doors, you can take off the roof. And so where would you lock stuff? So it's lockable front space, uh, the pass-through, also um, the hydrodynamic suspension. We have portal gear hubs. So it has 10-inch wheel travel, five inches up, five inches down. Has and huge ground clearance. Yeah, 15-inch ground clearance from wheel to wheel. So the, the arms are up out of the way, all the way across. And then you can go up to 20 inches when you want to. That's excellent. Yeah. Where do you get your motor? Motors, we are uh, we're going to be announcing all our vendors okay. very soon. So okay. There's a lot of stuff. I, okay, I'm we're not going to press you on that. Then. Dying to tell you, but it's soon. <laughs> yeah. soon. So you have two motors. Yeah. Is, is it one in the front, one yeah, in the back? Yeah, one in front, one back. And so it has half axles that go out to the portal gear hubs and into the wheels. Mm -hmm. All wheel all we'll drive, obviously. All wheel drive, all but the, the, but the and, th and this is where you're different. I mean, it's, it sort of it comes from where you started, which is on a farm. I mean, you're, you're targeting this market at a more... Uh, industrial users market, right? People on farms, people in factories, as opposed to a, a high style truck like right. Rivian, which is right. al also an electric, electric truck maker right. here. Right. Yeah, the, the idea was always to be a purpose built, lower volume, handmade kind of truck is how I envisioned it. So for my needs, I love the idea of having the, the 13 feet through the middle that you can, uh, you know, 13 foot boards and close up your tailgates kind of thing. Uh, the guys, uh, all the engineers, they're more off-road, so they brought in, you know, the portal gear hubs and all that kind of stuff, that was all them. Mm -hmm. So together, it just became a very useful truck in many different ways. The people we hear from the most are off-road enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. That's like, they're either the most vocal or the most that support us. But we have 28,000 reservations online, I think we just crossed. Yeah. And so a lot of those people email us all the time, you know, tech, you know, you know, through social media, and we respond to everything, Mark and Chet and people at the, at the team. Okay, we got a question from Barry Rector uh, from Indy, who says, hey, when you're off-road, you're out in the woods, you're going up and down the mountains, where do you charge this I knew, thing? I knew where that yeah. was going. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the battery pack, we're looking at 120 kilowatt hour pack. Big pack. Yeah, very big pack. Twice and, as big as what's in the Chevy Bolt. Right, for yeah, example. so it's, it's, it adds up, but um, that gives you about 200 mile range on uh, EPA combined. But that doesn't really mean anything for off-road. So it basically correlates about 10 hours of off-roading. So you just, like anything else, how much gas do you have with you? How long are you, do you want to be out there? You just know in advance, if I'm fully charged, I'm going out for like six hours, you have plenty of time to come back. And so. NC wrote in to say, whatever happened to talk about using Tesla's supercharging network? Oh yeah, I tweeted uh, Elon a long time ago just for, hey, just, just to get in the conversation. And so uh, tons of Tesla people were very supportive of that. Um, mm -hmm. Some were like, no, we're busy enough. You yeah. know, don't, don't introduce <laughs> that with it. Um, but yeah, uh, I never officially ask because everyone's just like, when are you gonna officially ask? And so we're basically, we have uh, CCS charging port in mind right now. So it it's, hasn't gone past the tweet. Gotcha. <laughs> so. gotcha, CCS gotcha. Is, the, is the Tesla standard? No, that's what's on our truck. But you so you couldn't use a Tesla. No, that's what I'm saying. If yeah. if we were to do something with Tesla, we'd switch to theirs. But I we haven't really gone there. Is yeah. this street legal? It will be, yeah. Yeah, and so in that in that sense, you're different than Mahindra, which is also a startup in this area. Right. Mahindra's doing off-road uh, vehicles, farm-capable vehicles, but they're not licensing them for the road just yet. And they're not electric. Yeah, that's good. Right. They're yeah. not electric. Yeah. And they're very cheap because they're crate 
made in India and created here and then put together here? The rocks are. The rocks yeah, are, yeah, yeah. Final assembly is yeah. here, right? But uh, the truck is a class three truck, so it'll be fully street legal for cla as a class three truck. So it'll be the only electric class three truck on, out there also. Okay, so class three, do you have to meet all the, the crash standards? Uh, crash standards, there are none for the, for class that three. class, but we're doing all simulation okay. crash so it'll standards. Be safe. Yeah, so we're doing our own level of due diligence, which is far above what that, you know, regulation, what those regulations are, and we're hitting a lot of the passenger vehicle ones too. Yeah, I, I should interject here too, if you guys wanna get, who, you in the audience, if you would like to get your questions to us, shoot us an email, shoot, send it to viewer mail, at autoline.tv. Keep it short and sweet and to the point. You're more likely that we'll uh, w ask your question. And we've got our, our phone, 620-288-6546, and you can call and we'll uh, probably take your phone call if your question's short. Okay, back to you, Robert. You've got a B1 and a B2 mm -hmm. model. What's the difference? Uh, the B1 is the sport utility truck, as we're calling it, because it's, it's not about... Uh, luxury really it's about um, a lot of capability in the truck so uh, that's where right now we're making the four-door version of what you see online which is the two-door so the rendering here the b1 is on the left and the b2 is on the right which is the pickup version they share the same componentry and mechanics and everything up to the c pillar and then we have uh, a six foot bed in the back of the four passenger b2 and then that middle uh, tailgate will come down and the glass will open and it'll give you a full four, eight foot bed. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's like a gladiator. Good. Take a Wrangler and make a gladiator. Yeah. yeah. B1 <laughs> and to B2. And will have the pass through. So in the B2, you'll be able to hold 16 foot boards with the tailgates closed. And on the B1, you'll have 13 foot boards. So who do you see as, as the customer for each of these vehicles? Um, Good question. I think the, the B1 will be more off-road enthusiasts. So this is the SUV version is the off-road one. Right, exactly. And then and that's, again, on my farm there, that's the two-door. We're starting with the four-door versions first in production, and then we'll come back to the two doors. So a lot of people want the two-door, and we and I want that too, and I want the two-door pickup. So we'll have the B1 and B2 four-doors, and then the two doors of both will come up behind that. And they'll all share the same DNA, portal gear hubs, all-wheel drive all the time. It, it is very Wrangler-esque, very Gladiator-esque. I mean, those those vehicles I'd are icons. I Defender myself. I don't. I don't even know what a Defender Land Rover. is. Okay, Land Rover, right? Yeah. So, in in terms, uh, Gary's talking about the target audience. Can you compete on price with a Jeep, or are you competing more with a Land Rover? Customer? Oh yeah, it, it won't definitely won't be in the Jeep world. Yeah, yeah and, that, that's, and that's the batteries. The batteries are still batteries. That's where your cost is. Low volume, mm -hmm. hand built. So it's it's You're really about a craftsman. Hundred thousand bucks then. We have don't have a price yet. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. the other thing we have to announce. Yeah, yeah. And everyone's like, tell us the price. It's we're yeah. still working on it because there's so many components and obviously we don't have the same purchasing power as the big guys. So you know it's a lot of back and forth. What's it made out of? It's all aluminum. Yeah. So um, aluminum body panels, everything. So really, what we want the truck to be is the one and only truck you'll need to buy. You keep it for the rest of your life. So as far as like how we paint it and how we protect it against corrosion and it being all aluminum, uh, we just, it's something, it'll be your, you know, your truck for life. Does it help uh, for, for a small company like you that Ford has gone all aluminum on a mass produced product like, like the F-150? Does that help bring aluminum costs down for you? Yeah, I would guess so. I, that's more of, uh, we, we're working with local uh, people to make the body white for us, mm -hmm. companies in Michigan. So that'll be their negotiating on the, on the aluminum side. But yeah, I'm sure it, it comes down to a better price for us for the full body and white. Yeah. So. And, and are you doing, is this a skateboard chassis? Are you doing a T battery? What sort of, how's the yeah, the battery, battery integrated? Yeah, the battery is fully on the bottom. So it's it's a big rectangle that comes up from the bottom. If you go online, you see that one animation of, of the insides of the B1 that we made back when we created this one. Uh -huh. It did have two battery packs that came in from the top on each side. It's changed since then. So the next, yeah, this one running now. So the, um, the new one is just a bigger battery pack. And that's also why we went four door because we just needed more space between the wheels for a bigger battery pack. Yeah. So as batteries progress and get lighter, smaller, cheaper, better, you know, like uh, we're all promised, then we can go back to and create a two door. The two door will have a different uh, wheelbase then? Yes, yeah, the four door is 12 inches longer than the two door that's sitting here. Mm -hmm. 
the, the uh, we, we've all been up to San Eamon Rose shop and see, and uh, seen the, uh, the the Tesla Model 3 taken apart up there. And one of the things that fascinated me about that is I, I just assumed that the, that one of the, the the basic tenets of a skateboard was it would provide structural rigidity for the rest of the chassis. Right. And Monroe says that's not the way Tesla designed it. Tesla really just kind of dropped the battery in and didn't really integrate it into the chat okay. the chassis. Uh, but there are other manufacturers I know are they're uh, they're using that so you know to make the chassis stiffer. Do you use the battery for stiffening? Yeah, well the 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 layout of the truck that Carl created, which is like a hashtag, you know, so you have the two rails through the middle and then and then crossing it. That gives you most of your you know rigidity there. But since the pack is the heaviest biggest part of the vehicle, you definitely want to incorporate that into the whole, you know, how it reacts with the vehicle and how it helps, you know, with all of the yeah. Support for the vehicle. So yeah, I mean, presumably that'd be a huge with an off-road vehicle. That'd be a big advantage. Yeah, yeah. And our center of gravity, when you're at the wheel, the center of gravity is basically right here, between mm -hmm. you know, down below your hip, basically, because mm -hmm. the battery's underneath, and the aluminum helps. The aluminum body helps reduce some of the weight. Mm -hmm. So, so I've, I've got to get back to the design. I mean, it's, it's it's a very simple design aesthetic, but I mean, what were you thinking about when you when you began to work on the styling for this? Vehicle? The the style comes from the fact that I hate anything that's not needed. So it was basically um, just flat sides, and how do you join this flat side with that flat side, and just you know you're done kind of thing, right? So um, and then it goes a little bit with that because like what's the the chamfer that runs along the whole side is kind of like the eye catching mm. part. So when you catch that just right with the light, it's really nice. So um, yeah, it was just about simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. And actually we had a lot of, um, we're going a lot of different directions with it when we were working on it. And it was just like, wait, let's stop. Let's take away some of the stuff that we've added on. And we just kept going back to simple. So um, it's very, you know, the hood is flat because I wanted as much storage space in the front. So everything is there for a reason. So we could have tried to make it more aerodynamic in the front, but you would have a less storage space. So we played with aerodynamics in the little touches. So right now the, the coefficient of drag is about the same as a Wrangler. Mm -hmm. So it's not amazing and it's not terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You actually took it in a wind tunnel. Yeah, we did. Yeah. For, for just kicks? Yeah. I mean, it's Yeah, a, no, it's that, was, that's, uh, that was to get some real feedback on it. And uh, the, especially with how the air went through the radiators and such because mm -hmm. we we're trying to you know get data for that too and that's why the new vehicles will have it has a f new noses on them so we opened up the front and more air goes to the front we need a bigger radiator radiators anyway and so now the air goes through the front and up the top in, in the photograph of that's the hunter he's a designer uh, of the pass through it seemed that the the beam was going all the way through the front and that the grill was open is, is that yeah the, there there's the yeah picture. there's yeah. a there. front there's a frunk and there's a front gate yeah, so it's, yeah, it gates you know, it's at both right, ends. Yeah, yeah. So, so I can open it here since your camera's on it. But yeah. anyway, so where's the radiator? The radiators are on the on above the wheels, so on both sides oh, okay. above the wheels. Yeah, and those are radiators for the battery for cooling it. Yes, for uh, motors, inverters, and battery. On the B1 first prototype, we did not have to cool the batteries because it's a test vehicle, if you will, um, and it's a different battery source. So the radiators were much smaller because they were just doing the motors and inverters and some other, you know, a lot of the electronics need cooling because yeah. everything's going right. crazy in there. So to your question about the pass through, Purdue wrote in, how long are carpet rolls? I always see those things protruding out of the rears of vans. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you'll get just about a whole carpet right? roll in that yeah. thing. Protruding out the front of one. Yeah. yeah. And Barry Rector wrote back, how are you going to sell these things, service them? Right, we're working on that now. We're, uh, we have a few different paths that we're looking into. Uh, Chet, our salesperson, uh, is based in LA, where we th think that most of these will sell in California because half of all of EVs sell in California now, I believe. So um, it's basically about having our own, you know, having our own base camps to service from and send techs out from. Is it uh, partnering with a well-known nationwide service provider? It's probably gonna be some kind of combination of it. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what volumes you're thinking about? Yeah, so it's low volume. It's always gonna. I always see it as always being low volume in the, in the world of of you know the big guys. So our first year, we're looking at a thousand. That'll be like kind of a founder series, if you will. We're not gonna call it that, but um, so that was will be the first ones out of the gate. Will be about a thousand, and then we'll just slowly ramp up from there. I love what you're saying because this to me 
is totally realistic. Mm. You know, if you had said, oh, we're going to do 10,000, then 20,000, it would have been well, lots of luck, buddy. But I like your approach. Right. It's like, I believe everything about the company, everyone on our team, the design of the truck, the engineering of the truck, how we think about everything is just what makes sense, what is actually doable, and let's go down that path. Because to throw out fake numbers or pretend anything, it's just, there's, there's no reason for it. So. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at that sort of volume, um, you know, you said originally you had a press break and you're making them with the press break. Right. I mean, are, are you looking toward some more sophisticated yeah. metal forming operations yeah. going forward? Yeah, so we'll rely heavily on vendors, local vendors. Uh -huh. So uh, the body and white we believe will be made for us by a well-known body and white you know, provider in the area and maybe even come in painted already, hmm. uh, dipped and painted for us. Uh, battery pack, we, you know, if we buy the you know, cells from here or the module from here and the pack from here, whatever, that might be made all for us and come in as a pack. You know, so we still have a, you know, a few little final decisions to make on that kind of stuff, but relying heavily on vendors who have know their business really, really well, and we work together with them to give us product that's to our specs mm -hmm. was the way we're going about it. Instead of reinventing everything and then needing to raise billions of dollars, I didn't think that was realistic, even though companies are doing it, yeah. and that's great for them. And when, every time they do it and get tons of money behind things, that's great for us because there'll just be more components out in the market for us to, you know, buy. So Along the lines of the batteries, several questions there from Brent McKinney and Arlene Allen. What kind of battery? Cells? Uh, pouches? If uh, they're cells, 18650, 2170s, what are you thinking? All to be announced soon. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to say that a lot during this thing. But it is it is about um, when it's right with the provider to make the announcement together. So it's that kind of thing. All right. Since the three of us are homers here and you were from New York, but you moved your operation to Detroit, talk to us about what motivated that right so um, the shop that I bought was like a few miles from our farm up in the Catskills and that's what renovated that and then started like looking around like who can help me build you know electric vehicle so then uh, Carl was amazing enough to be uh, trust and come over and uh, join the team so we built this upstate and then I was trying to get more engineers hired and they just no one would move there from here <laughs> this basically was the problem but the, the first engineers problem. are here in other words yeah yeah you're so just like rivian here. i mean rivian the same thing it starts in florida right and they're down there and they say where's the talent the right. talent is here yeah and so we moved here for that and the vendors i was making trips constantly to meet with vendors so it was definitely uh basically when i started this it was like whatever decision means it might help in getting the truck made is the right decision. So I was like, does it make sense for us to be Detroit? The obvious answer was yes, so we just, we just did it. Did the yeah. state help you? Uh, no. Not really, huh? Interesting. Yeah, I'm hey. not big into uh, looking for handouts, handouts and tax, for you. tax That's, dollars either. I, I love it. I mean, I'm not gonna say if, if it, something's there, they but- They wanna give you, you know, millions yeah, of dollars, you're not gonna turn it down, you'll, right? You'll take the $7,500 yeah. federal credit. <laughs> yeah, I didn't play that game of like pretending you know, states divide against each other. I knew I had to be in Detroit. So. How many people work for your company? Right now we're 22. 22. How are you funding it all? Uh, I'm funding it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I had a, a very successful partnership with uh, in a former life, and that company sold in uh, 2013 and then 2016 again. So I, it was a double double good <laughs> and that money is all going straight into this so. that's a cos cosmetics company yeah, right masters were organics you, were you doing cosmetics design for that company what kind of cosmetics company was it yeah it was uh, hair care and, sh and skin care yeah. so john masters was the were you was producing the, a product or you yeah. were at the chemical end what, no i was in the marketing uh advertising side of it and packaging design yeah, and, so you're then doing I, industrial design. and then i took all over as coo mm -hmm. he was always ceo and so i just ran the whole company and that's when i was like oh i like running companies and hiring people who know things better than me and, you know, put them to work, so. Yeah. Is there a similar, I mean, in the cosmetics world, is there a similar sort of aesthetic that you liked in cosmetics that was simple in yeah, packaging? Well, I, I, I mean, just like, this is simple. I tried packaging. to have shampoo bottles that had no words on it, but it w didn't fly. <laughs> I like it that simple, but yeah. yeah, so. Should at least say shampoo. Yeah, yeah. So, like, our trucks won't say our name on it. It'll be like, you'll oh, have to know. You just know. <laughs> I like that. If you know, you know. What, what, is, what is your sense of the competitive landscape that you're entering. Right. 
Well, that was a big thing from the beginning, too, was knowing where this was going to go. And I knew everything was going to be electric someday, including trucks, even though when we unveiled this in 2017, there was nothing like it, right? So it still isn't. So um, I knew that we needed to be in a, our own little niche and stay there and, and own it. So I think we've done that. I, don't, I think we put together in this truck what most car companies wouldn't do. It'd be either too expensive or too specific or you know, too limiting. Mm -hmm. So anyone else out there who's doing larger volumes and they purposely are doing that, great. That's your, that's your world. I just don't have the mind to want to go there. I don't want to raise billions of dollars. I don't want to get millions of you know, square feet of, of manufacturing space. I just okay, want to I wanna know everyone who works at the company and be able to walk out on the floor and we're making it basically by hand. But what if I, I saw in your wind tunnel testing, it looked like you were at an FCA yep. tunnel. Yeah, they rented out. I could see them going, damn, we got to do electric Jeeps. Robert's already done it. Robert, why don't we buy your company? No, I mean, I don't think they'll do that. <laughs> but our idea is just to uh, just grow organically and just uh, have fun. I try to have yeah. fun when I'm not worrying about certain things. But. Knowing what you know, do you think it's possible for other entrepreneurs to get into vehicle production, low volume sort of thing? Yeah, definitely. Um, you just need some money and uh, you just have to keep going. We've hit so many roadblocks and so many times we were just like, this is impossible to continue from here for many different reasons. And really the only thing is just to keep going, just keep going, keep going, keep going. So, and have the right people, you know, who say we can do that. And that's the whole team. So. It, sound, it sounds like though that, that um, uh, your, your brand is, is, is a rugged utility brand. I mean, one of, one of the things that uh, attracted me to Tesla was, was it wasn't so much an electric car, it was, it was a different operating system. I mean, the, the car right. is so different to operate than any other car when you're, when you're in it. Um, uh, lo looking at your design and what you've done with the interior of the car, this, this seems targeted at a customer who wants utility. You're not trying to do any w crazy electronics right. in this. In this well, way. it has crazy electronics in it because it has to, you know, yeah. for inverters and all that kind of stuff. Right, they all, right. They all I mean, in terms of, in terms right. of the interface, the operating right. system. Yeah, we, we want the interface to be that your hands are on the wheel yeah. and you're looking out the window. Mm -hmm. There are no big screens. There's nothing going on. It's for taking off-road. It's if you have it on your farm or, or where, wherever you take it, you're, you're having fun with it. And it's, you know, we have a whole glass top right now, which will be an option and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and you can convert it any way you want, take the doors off, take the glass off and yeah. just, and just have fun with it. It's a yeah. fun truck. I You're like to think of it. not making any sort of autonomous play. No, nothing like right. that. No plans for that. So my, I joke that like, when you want to disconnect from all of that, this is the truck you do it. <laughs> is it I like that. Do you see this as being someone's second vehicle or could it be their only vehicle? I see it as probably their third vehicle. <laughs> it's probably gonna be second or third, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it'll go on sale next year? Yeah, we are uh, making the four-door right now and then DV models right after that, moving into our space in Detroit, which we're about to sign the deal on. And, uh, and towards the end of next year, is have the first ones come off the line. Has, has there been anything that surprised you on this journey that you, like completely unexpected? Uh, well, actually, yeah, I, I was, I was uh, it was uh, how, nascent the whole electric world is like tesla was crazy ahead of their time because you think oh there's there's um electric vehicles out there you know teslas are out there there's got to be suppliers and all that kind of stuff no you would go to these shows and people are just starting out you know there's some uh so they they had to make a lot of their components because they just weren't available on the market now companies are getting into it now that billions of dollars are being spent by the big guys towards evs there's a whole hundred years of of gasoline technology and reliance that has to switch now and that's going to take a long time so we had a lot of difficulty finding the components for this strong of a truck because so many things were made for the small you know putt putt little smaller electric vehicles so when you need a charger that's this big or an inverter that's big it was they weren't out there so now they're coming around more and it makes it more you know likely for us to go into production which we are you must be real pleased with the reaction. You said 28,000 yeah. orders or well, the hand raisers? Yeah, hand raisers. Okay. Yeah, so we take all your information and we don't bug you all that much okay. about it, but we, we're there for uh, sending you updates. 
So, and they come in all the time and we've been a little quiet while we've been engineering to production. So we haven't had big flashy shows or anything like that. So, but the, it just keep the reservations keep happening. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, so it's, we'll have a lot more announcements soon and, and hopefully get to production. So, so you, you have cooling. Yep. Uh, one of the frustrations I've found with EVs, including my own car, the Model 3, is that you get into wintry conditions. Look like you had a couple videos there where you were an, on a wintry landscape. Yeah. Um, you, you, get, you get below 20 degrees in most EVs these days and range gets cut in half. Are you, are you addressing that at all? Can you heat the battery? Yeah, our battery pack will be heated and cooled. Yeah, so, so is that, a, is that, a, is that, a, is that a, a, a water-cooled system around the battery? What does that look liquid like? Liquid-cooled, yeah, so there'll be okay. liquid cooling plates, mm -hmm. and then there'll be, I think, just like electric pads, basically, that just will give off enough heat, and it's gonna be so sealed that you don't need that much heating in it. But the idea is to keep it optimal. So we, we have all the strategies of like, if you're parking it for a couple of days, it's going to keep itself warm, and yeah. and it's got to know, you know, is it plugged in, keeping itself warm, versus unplugged, keeping itself warm, and then, you know, if you want to store it for some reason, like, you know, you turn all that kind of stuff off. But yeah, we, uh, we want to keep them in a certain yeah. So area. you don't see any range degradation with cold weather. No, I, no, I don't see it that way. It's going to be more about, you know, if you're carrying like it's a class three truck, so it can hold five thousand pounds. Right. Now, if you hold five thousand pounds, your range is going to change. <laughs> yeah. You know. That's the challenge. But if you want to take five thousand pounds from one side of your farm to the other side of your farm and back, you can do that a lot of times. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know. But uh, weather's not going to be an issue. As weather, as you see weather will always affect. You know, because if you put on the AC and stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. weather-related issues. But that's the same with any electric vehicle. Right. But yeah, we don't see, you know obvious changes to the performance because we want to sell them and you know we have a lot of people in canada who have who have reserved the trucks so we want it to go everywhere a lot of people in oslo in norway you know like the big spots for electric they're they're reserving it right sounds like that thousand isn't going to be enough i know right Hopefully, yeah so that'd be a great wood. problem yeah yeah good problem <laughs> Hey, look, we're going to have to wrap this segment up, but Robert Bollinger, thanks so much for coming thanks so much. in here. Thanks so much for bringing in your vehicle, too. Thank you. This Thank is you. really good. Thanks for getting in. Yeah. It looks great. No, uh, when you guys are ready to announce more stuff, you ought to come back on the show. Oh, definitely. definitely. We'll dive into those details That's at that great. time. Thanks. Okay, real good. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a quick commercial break right now. we got a lot of stuff to talk about of what's going on in the industry, so don't go away. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. All right, we're back. And this is where we need a little bit of a fanfare. So, wow. <laughs> that was very little bit, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's time for Dr. Data. All right, so, theme, yeah, all right, so, theme song. so, so this is, this is going to be, this is going to be topical in its presentation. And you'll immediately, I hope, recognize what this is when Katie brings up the first slide here. What does that look like? Uh, it looks like white letters on a blue background. <laughs> Which is used by? Ford. Ford. No. <laughs> Jeopardy. Oh, Jeopardy. Oh. <laughs> it's we're so, real, so, we're real so, car guys, so, aren't we? So, 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 <laughs> maybe we can mil win a million bucks here. See, that guy is just, he's on his roll. So, so we have a Jeopardy question here. So you have to answer this question as what is 
blank. You have to answer yeah. it with a question. You have to answer it with a question, because if you don't, oh. you're wrong. <laughs> okay, you, you get disqualified. So, 2% of the population in 63 comp countries in Q4 2018 used it, and it has 91 million, quote, monthly active platform consumers, close quote. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, you got to hit. Wow. See, this is where we need the music. Yeah, yeah, we, we really do. Well, this is automotive, right? Do, 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 it's automotive. This is automotive. Okay. Do, 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 do. Three countries. What is. Ooh, look at Henry's end of it. See, the key is that monthly active platform consumers. So I would what, say what? Yeah. Android what? Auto. See, what... Yeah, I was, I was going to say, uh, what is. Um... Apple CarPlay. Apple CarPlay. So you say, what is Apple CarPlay? And you're disqualified because you just said Android Auto, so you, you, your answer doesn't count. Oh, I didn't ask it in the form of a question. But it doesn't matter because you were wrong anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, bring up the answer. Uber. Uber. 2%. So, so, so in the Uber it had its filing yeah. for uh, its, its, its IPO. And uh, it, it, was, it was fascinating to learn that... Um, 24% of its business in 2018 came from five cities, L.A., New York, San Francisco, London, and Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. Is it, you, you think that seems sensible to you? Yeah, because uh, I, well, I spent a lot of time in those cities, and, um, and, and that demographic uh, uses it heavily. It makes, uh, it makes less sense uh, as you get out into the... Into less, it's just like public tra transportation. I mean, you come out to Detroit and you look at the met, look at the data, look at the metrics of building public transit in a in a uh, in a population as as diffuse as Detroit. Mm -hmm. It makes no financial sense. I mean, you you got to have intense uh, population density for for that business model to work. And I got to believe it's the same with Uber. And it was Otherwise, you just got cars just just driving around looking for customers. Mm -hmm. and it's also interesting that since we've last been in the studio doing the show, um, that um, Toyota and Denso or Denso putting in with SoftBank a billion dollars into Uber, into Uber, um, and this presumably is going to be used for the uh, development of self-driving vehicles. I find that fascinating because, you know, here's Tesla and we got to talk about them, too, mm -hmm. announcing that they're going to do their own taxi service. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got Ford saying it's going to do something. Gee, I'm supposed to launch this year. You know, the Germans are all uh, joining together, or at least BMW and Mercedes are to go together on this. And but they all want to do their own ride hailing services. Here's Toyota and Denso pouring all this money into Uber. Very different approach. And, and don't forget that that um, Uber had also established a deal with Volvo. So you've got you know the Geely thing going on as well as you've got the Toyota thing going on. Yeah, well, and you got and you got uh, uh, Chrysler and Jaguar um, providing Waymo with their vehicles and building a plan here, just like Robert Bolin, uh, uh, Bollinger. Everybody comes here because this is where the engineers are. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. You want to make the vehicles? <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, so let's let's talk about that for a minute. So so Waymo announced this week that they've reached an agreement with American Axle and Manufacturing, which makes hmm, ax axles, um, in, the, in the city of Detroit that they would be using a portion of what had been a front axle plant. And I'm not clear, I mean, to do what? To take Pacificas and put in their systems? To take the, the E-Pace and put in their systems? I mean, what, what's going to go on there? Yeah, they're going to convert them to full autonomous vehicles. They're going to put in the, the LIDARs and the all the other sensors, the radars and the sonars. And, you there's know, there's no drivetrain there. Why would you, why, what's the advantage of an American axle plant? It's just an available facility. Just yeah. space. Just, just manufacturing. Right. So the other thing, so, so. Oh, but here's the other thing. Magna's going to run the whole thing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, because, because it seems to me, okay, so, so the Pacifica is made in Windsor, which is right across the river, the river from Detroit, but the Jaguar is made mm -hmm. in uh, Austria, right? Right. Yeah. So they're going to be shipping those vehicles from right. Austria to Detroit. Isn't that plant run by Magna also? Yeah, in it is a Magna plant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the new manufacturing model. No kidding. Here's a supplier that can do it all. Yeah. So, but, so, so, is this move by Waymo meaningful, or is it just, 
Yeah. No, I think it's meaningful because when you're talking, what is it, 20,000 Pacificas and 10,000 I-Paces, I think 30,000 20, 20, vehicles. 20,000 I-Paces now. 20,000 I-Paces. sold, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, that's a lot of vehicles. Even though you're doing this at slow volume, you need an assembly plant to be able to do this. You need a workforce that knows it. You need the suppliers right nearby that are making all this stuff to put it on. But but why would you why would you have a separate facility to integrate this rather than being right in the facility where the vehicle's being made? Yeah, well, I mean, for, you got right off manufacturing better than I do. Yeah, well one thing is you know Gary is Manufacturing plants are complex enough as it is. And to do this on a separate line, A, there may not be room for it. Because this is not going to go down the, the, the line and you've got, you know, somebody putting in the side view mirror and the LiDAR system. No, it, all the autonomous stuff is going to be added on right. as a, a secondary operation. In fact, I would imagine they probably have to disassemble part That's, of the vehicle. Which is, which is my point. I mean, yeah. so, so you're putting in these man hours to build the thing, right? Then you're taking parts of it apart. Yeah. And I'm sure it's not as simple as, you know, just, just plugging in a few wiring harnesses and saying, oh, we're good to go. You know, we've got the braking. We've got the steering. You know, we've got all that there. Although, um, you know, to go back to John's point, I mean, if you're Ford and you own the autonomous company, if you're GM and you own cruise automation, maybe they will integrate it. You know, you go up here to Orion and uh, the, those bolts that will be rolling off the line, maybe they will be fully integrated yeah. with, the, with their LiDAR and everything that's going out to cruise automation. So mm -hmm. it, it, it may just be as simple as, as uh, you know, Waymo's a contractor with Chrysler mm -hmm. and Jaguar. And if, if this business model proves out over time, they may take an ownership interest in those companies and start to integrate it into their manufacturing. Oh, yeah. No, the OEMs at one point will want to have this, to your point, Gary, going down the line, and it can be uh, autonomous or non-autonomous, one right behind the other. Hmm. But we're, we're early in the game now. It's, it, we're so early in the game. I think it makes all the sense in the world for Waymo to go, you know, we need our own facility. May even well be that they don't exactly want to show FCA and JLR yeah. what they're doing. Right. That may be the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, I, and and it was it was fascinating uh, to me uh, with Tesla because um, Tesla is not doing lidar, and uh, you know the the state of the state of the art for the industry right now. If you want to be on the road and be fully autonomous, you got to have lidar. But when you talk to engineers who are looking out a few years, they say, we don't want LiDAR. LiDAR is complex, it's expensive. We would prefer just to do things with cameras and, uh, and, and radar and GPS. And so um, in, in that sense, uh, Tesla's, Tesla's forward looking, but I, I don't know how you get from here to 2020 without LiDAR. Well, okay, so you're, you're, you're mentioning Tesla and, and they had their big uh, autonomous day this week and uh, where they talked to analysts and, and talked about this new um, um, computer chip that they have designed. It's the full self-driving computer, the FSD computer. And I thought it was interesting that uh, as, as I watched the like three hour video which uh, you can find on the uh, in, uh, Tesla investment. We started 45 minutes late. <laughs> More than an hour late. <laughs> and uh, so, so Andre Karpathy, the senior director of AI for, for Tesla said, um, quote, LiDAR is really a shortcut. It sidesteps the fundamental problems, the important problem of visual recognition that is necessary for autonomy. It gives a false sense of progress and is ultimately a crutch. It does give like really fast demos. <laughs> okay, and and it was and, and and Elon came out and described it as being like an appendix. <laughs> right. And it's just, and he, you have he too said many appendices. And he says, yeah, and you just add, you have like eight of them. And it's like, how good is that? Yeah. And, well, and, and, I, the, my 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 and again uh, the the couple engineers I know in the development uh, end of this say uh, ultimately all you need is cameras. Uh, and, and, and which and, is which is the, so so and, so they're and, using eight cameras. That's right. I mean, they 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 say that the John and I are drive, driving Model Threes right now, and and I believe John, your car has has no. Yeah, I don't think any of them has. Your 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 car could be retrofitted right now, coming down the line with this 
Uh, yeah, the, the car I'm driving right in. now was built in December, so it's a pretty new car. Yeah, yeah. So they're 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 putting them in the car. They claim though that they have all the hardware they need to do fully uh, autonomous yeah, driving. But, you, but I, the, the, I was just what I was getting at was the the Musk quote that I that I liked was. Um, human beings drive with their eyes. We don't have lasers shooting out of our right. eyeballs. All we need is a camera, our eyeballs. Right. Yeah, it but I don't totally buy that. You know, it, it, for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, your eyes age, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> there's one thing. And also, uh, there's a lighting situation, whereas LiDAR doesn't know if it's day or night. It, it doesn't make it's any it's difference better to at it. Night. It's better it at doesn't night. know if it's foggy. And, and here's the other thing, too, is because I was just talking with Velodyne uh, and uh, some of these topics. In the rain, what they were telling me is LiDAR puts out such a strong pulse and a, an array of, of pulses at that. It can see through rain. So even if the lens gets wet, it doesn't matter. It's still going to be able to see through it. Right. A camera lens cannot do that. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, it's, it's, you know, th this whole thing, I mean, I, I had the guys from um, Blackmore Sensors came to my office and gave me a ride and showed me their, their LiDAR and, and uh, you know, they, they were saying, um, okay, we can do stuff that Velodyne can't do. And, and then it turns out that I'd always thought that LiDAR was LiDAR, but there's actually long range LiDAR and there's short range LiDAR. So you have to have both. And then, oh, by the way, everyone thinks that you have to have multiple redundant sensors and you be going cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. When will this ever be affordable? Except for you, Henry. Well, see, where it does get affordable is when you put it into a ride-sharing uh, service. Right. So and then instead of one consumer like any one of us trying to buy this expensive stuff, no, you amortize it off, you know, yeah. running these cars 20 hours a day, multiple, multiple users. Then it does become affordable. But, you know, I've, I've got to give Elon a whole lot of credit. And Sandy Monroe sort of intimated some of this when, when we had him on the show the last time. And, and basically... Um, when the guy, and I, I don't remember his name, who was in charge of developing that new computer chip for Tesla said that, and he'd come from Apple, mm -hmm. and um, he, he told Elon, okay, I want to do this, and uh, are you going to uh, back me on this? And, and Elon said, yeah, just go ahead and do it, and uh, you know, develop this thing specifically for, for self-driving vehicles, and uh, you know, just, just green light it and said, go do it. And, you know, as, as Sandy said, you know, the electronics that those guys have in their vehicle is so far ahead of what everybody else is doing. And again, it just sort of occurred to me, you know, why isn't this coming from Daimler? Why isn't this coming from Volkswagen Group? Why isn't this coming from General Motors? I mean, why is it that this, this guy who, you know, is, is you he's know, breaking all the rules? Right. I mean, and he's losing money by, you know, the cubic ton, but, yeah. um, but still, I mean, it's just like, yeah, go do that. Yeah, you know, but, it's just like, but, but again, I mean, it goes, it goes back to what Robert Bollinger says. He's, he's, in, he's in upstate New York. I want to build a car. Where do I get the talent? I go to Detroit. That's where you build. I, I, got, I got a family full of engineers. If you're electric, if you're electric uh, engineer and you want to do electronics, you go to Silicon Valley. There is so much talent out there. That is working on this stuff, mm -hmm. and that's where Musk is. Right, and that's a different, that's a different culture. And yeah, that's why the electronics are so advanced in these vehicles. Rambler Andy says, "Don't we, the three of us, realize that Tesla uses cameras and radar and ultrasonics? Right, and GPS, and, yes, and we do know all that. Right. What we're focusing in on here is the fact that Elon says he doesn't need lidar, and so far he's the only car company in the world that believes that." Although you're saying you've talked to people uh, working on AVs that believe right. that cameras are the ultimate solution. Yeah, well, uh, lo looking out, they, they just want cameras. Yeah, the LiDAR is expensive and, and brings the in... The price of that's coming down, too. That's true, but, you know, everything has a cost. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, 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 I gather that, that LiDAR is just exponentially more expensive than... It is. ...than, this, than the rest of this hardware, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty simple pretty simple hardware. And, and, and again, I think these systems all work together. So if you have uh, GPS and sonar cameras all working, working together, they, they, they can get around the issues um, that they're lacking with, with LiDAR. Mm -hmm. But again, that's down the road. I mean, I, you know, t talking about putting self-driving, the, the idea that, that by this time next year, 
I can put my Tesla into the fleet if I make the $7,000 upgrade to the new chip and put my car out on the five, road. That's 5,000. Yeah, seven. I think it's 5,000 at the point of purchase, right. but if you oh. upgrade later, it's seven. Yeah, retro, right? Yeah, oh. right, that's right. A afterward, it's, it's uh, 7,000 and then uh, put my car into the fleet. That's right, you're gonna <laughs> amortize, a, you're gonna a, amortize a, the cost of that, Henry. Yeah, but as a, as a car without anybody at the wheel, it just, it just seems unbelievable to me. Yeah. But speaking of Tesla, they just reported big losses, huge drop in sales and profitability, or certainly revenue and profitability. Are these guys going to make it? I ask that rhetorically. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, again, Robert, the, you know, Robert said the cost is in the battery. I mean, the, the, the battery prices are, are, are so high, and Tesla, Tesla will tell us, you know, we're making a gigafactory, we're going to bring the, the cost down, but I, it, it, you, you can't make money right now. Even at the, That's why they're not making the $35,000 car. They can't they make can't money make a profit. because the battery is so, is so expensive. And, and, and that leads to the next question is, if Tesla, which dominates the EV market right now, I mean, when people talk about EV sales, you're talking about Tesla. It's like 60% of the market. Mm -hmm. Why is every other automaker following their business model? If, electric, if EVs don't make financial sense, why is GM saying well, we're becoming an electric automaker? Okay, because Ford the government says we're becoming... dictate. Oh, okay, but, Come on, uh, that's yeah, the they, only reason. But the government doesn't buy cars. Okay, but, okay, but, but isn't it part of Tesla's problem its model just as well as its, its advantage? Okay, think about this. Have you ever seen a Tesla ad on television? Never. Okay, how many ads have you seen for an F-150 during a single football game? <laughs> right? Yeah, a billion dollars worth. <laughs> right, I mean, it's just, and, and so, so here you have a situation where, you know, they, they, they do no advertising, they have no marketing, they essentially have no dealerships. I mean, and they're still selling a lot of vehicles. Yeah. Now, if you're, if you're General Motors or Ford, You've got lots of dealers. You've got a big marketing budget. You, you know, I mean, it's it's you're gonna you're gonna create this demand. I I think we're gonna get to the point where, you know, how many people actually know what is under the hood of their car right now? Not many. Okay, if you say to someone, is that a six cylinder? Is it turbocharged? Is it a four? Is it a V eight? You know, you'd say to somebody, uh, um, you know. Do you have a V12 under that thing? And uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, th they don't know. And, and at some point, it's going to be, is it an electric car or a non-electric car? I mean, despite the fact that, you know, you're plugging it in. But I, I think that becomes a wash and it becomes the product. I mean, so we're looking at this thing. I mean, I think that'd be great to have this. this the Bollinger. Yeah. 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 Have a it, B1. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just. It's $100,000. Well, you could have that then right now. Right? But, uh, <laughs> well, I would say, I mean, they're smart and they're doing, they, they know what their demographic is. It's a niche demographic. It's a third car. Right. Mass market out there is first car. Mm -hmm. uh, it's people with one car, two cars. They keep them in apartments. Uh, unlike me, they, they're, they're, they're not going to be willing to, 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 to uh, spend an extra $2,000 to wire their garage, to plug in their car every night. I mean, this is a mass market. You have to get, and, that, and that's, that's Henry Ford and the Model T. You get to a certain volume, infrastructure follows. You make, a, you make cell phones, you get to a certain volume, infrastructure follows. This, this technology is not only unaffordable right now for Tesla, it does not, it's not at a volume where infrastructure is following. Not so, only that, it's getting worse. So I looked at uh, fourth quarter sales of EVs last year. I'm looking at just the U.S. market mm -hmm. in first quarter this year. They're down. You know, the total market's down 2%. They're down nearly 6%. Yeah. Three times a greater decline than the market overall. That's interesting. And guess what? Tesla's actually propping them up. Tesla's only down 2%. If you do not count Tesla, all the rest of the electric cars are down 24%. Wow, Huge drop. And that's with new entrants coming into the market, like the I-Pace. So, you know, there's a mistaken belief by some people that, oh, Tesla sales are going down because all these new EVs are coming to the market. No, the whole segment's going down. Hmm. This was alluded to earlier in the show by you, John, and, and um, in this perhaps gets to this point of, of volume and the possibility of infrastructure following Ford putting in half a billion dollars into Rivian. Big news. So, so what do you guys think about that? 
Yeah, it's fascinating because we, at the news, we initially reported that um, um, the, 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 the two, there, were, there were two entities interested in, in Rivian, which, which makes a cool looking product. We haven't tested it yet, but it, but it looks good on paper. Um, Amazon is going to put in money because Amazon sees the advantage of a, of a, uh, a skateboard platform uh, for autonomous vehicles. You can, you can move lots of boxes in, in this thing. The skateboard being the batteries and then, wheel batteries. Mo and then the wheel motors. Yeah. It's just, just like uh, what, what uh, Bollinger, Bollinger is doing with this. Is that, that whole box on top is empty space. Amazon can put all kinds of boxes in there and deliver them to you and me. And, um, and, but secondly, they needed an, a, an OEM to help them with manufacturing. They, they needed, and we thought it was GM. That's what we reported. It was going to be GM was going to get, go into any, to this Indiana plant and help them with manufacturing. Illinois uh, plant. Illinois, oh, is it Illinois? Yeah, yeah that's right. Normal, Old Mr. normal plant, Illinois. Illinois. And, uh, Home and, of beer nuts. And so, somehow the, the GM uh, talks fell apart, and Ford came in very quickly after that. I think it was starting before that. Maybe. May because I, I, here's how I'm reading the tea but, leaves. But that's their industrial piece. Right. I'm, here's how I'm reading the tea leaves. These manufacturers approached Rivian. Maybe it approached them. I don't know. And GM got way down the line, very close to signing something. Yeah. But it wanted, GM wanted exclusive, uh, you know, traditional OEM access to the Rivian uh, skateboard. And they were like, no, guys, we're not going to go this way. I think they already were talking with Ford mm -hmm. and probably knew that Ford was not going to demand exclusivity, leaving the door open to go to yet other automakers, too. Mm -hmm. So Ford is going to be using this for undefined vehicle. They didn't say whether it would be a truck or whether it would be an SUV or Except which, that. Which is, which is pretty much all that's left, right? I mean, yeah. they're not going to make a Fusion. No. Um, yeah, yeah. Not a Fiesta. And what's Rivian make? Trucks and SUVs. Right. Yeah. So what, wait, what wait. I see it is, you know, Ford's been working on this all-electric F-150. But we all know, and Tesla's taught the world, if you want to do an electric car, go clean sheet and do it as an electric car. Don't take an existing platform. Go clean sheet. Well, why do automakers go with existing platforms. Nissan modified an existing platform to make the Leaf. Chevy modified an existing platform to make the Bolt, and so on down the line. Because <laughs> you can't make any money at it. And if you go clean cheat, you're going to lose your ass. So you take an existing product and electrify it. But it's a compromise. So Ford and GM are looking at, like, damn, this company Rivian, they got a skateboard ready to go. We've got to get an insurance policy against Tesla because Tesla has cleaned the clock of all the upscale European luxury brands. What if they did that to our pickup trucks? You know, if you're Ford Motor Company and, and you lose contract. the crown jewels, you're screwed. So here's an insurance policy. Let's buy $500 billion worth of, uh, or $500 million worth of Rivian, and bada boom, bada bing, we got a platform probably for half the cost of what it would cost us to do it ourselves. But they said they're gonna continue with the F-150 they are. Right. I think they're too far down the line to give up on that. Right. But but uh, th then this uh, with the clean sheet, it also gives them the opportunity may maybe to make to start a separate brand, an EV brand, because I, I think that's the other huge challenge for the for the companies here. The, the advantage of Tesla is it is an EV brand. It is by definition an EV brand. That's why it uh, is, is so powerful. These brands have a lot of baggage. Uh, uh, Ford, Chevy. And so, you know, ultimately, you may just want to create a different brand and putting on a skateboard chassis, uh, totally different chassis makes sense. I, I think you're right, Henry. I, I think that F-150 buyers have no interest in electrics, mm -hmm. and electric truck buyers have no interest in F-150s. And you could say the same for a Silverado, Ram, Tundra, whatever. Uh, is, it, is it no interest in F-150 or Silverado, or is it no interest in Ford and Chevrolet? You know, Ford doesn't do well with pass cars, but damn, do they do well with trucks. And people who would never walk into a Ford dealership for a pass car will walk in to buy an F-150. I, I think if your mindset is, I got to buy a pickup, you will consider traditional Detroit brands that you otherwise would not touch. Yeah. That's my perception. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, and I think the electric market is, is going the same way. I, I, I know, John, you share this. I, I'm... 
I, I am not convinced that just because Audi and Volvo and, and Mercedes are coming into the EV market means they're going to sell in that market. I mean, those again, those brands have a lot of baggage. Mm -hmm. You go up against a clean sheet electric brand like, like um, Tesla, Tesla or Lucid or right, if or Rivian, Faraday comes back or Rivian. I don't know. Right. They can compete. I think that that's a just a, that's a, that's a customer coming in for a different different reason. Um, that, it's interesting what you say about GM and, and uh, the difference between GM and Ford and Rivian because, uh, I mean, this news is out there, but Panin Farina, which is now getting into uh, automobile manufacturing, is contracting with Rivian on that skateboard chassis. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple, manuf multiple brands out there that want to use that skateboard. All right, I want to sw switch gears entirely, and you've, we've, over mm -hmm. past months you've mentioned this, and I find this to be fascinating. Um, so. It was announced this week that uh, Jose Munoz is now going to be uh, heading up uh, Hyundai um, North America and Hyundai Motor America and is the chief operating officer for all of Hyundai. He came from Nissan. Yeah. And a few years back, uh, a man named Carlos Tavares, who was basically number two to Carlos Ghosn, um, he said in an interview that one day he would like to be the CEO of a company, and, and uh, Mr. Gohan took exception to that fact and wanted uh, Mr. Tavares to apologize, and Mr. Tavares said, I'd prefer not to, and months later, he became the CEO of uh, Group PSA in France, which is purchased Opel from General Motors, right. and this man seems to have turned that around. So. Uh Will Munoz have the same sort of effect on Hyundai, do you think? Well, you know, Hyundai America right now, they're doing pretty good. You know, would we, at New York, we counted what now they have, is it seven SUVs? Right. I mean, they've gone from almost nothing, well, they had Their two. market share is still pretty small. Yeah, right it, no, no, it is. Uh, Munoz could be good. He was... Uh, Carlos Ghosn's go-to guy. Remember, he had been here. They just moved him to China to say, hey, you go straighten out the China thing. And when Ghosn got arrested, Carlos uh, Munoz, Jose Munoz realized that <laughs> this isn't going to work for me. He quit the company. He knew what was going to happen. He quit before they chopped his head off. And... Uh, uh, so he was on the, um, the the Renault side, not the no Nissan side. He was Nissan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was based here. He was running Nissan North America, okay. Nissan uh, America. Mm -hmm. I he was would, he was Gohn's guy. He was Gohn's yeah. guy. Yeah, he was right. most recently the chief performance officer for the right. Nissan Motor Corp mm -hmm. and chairman of Nissan China. Well, you know it's interesting. Koreans are always going to run Hyundai. That's mm -hmm. just the way it is. But when you look at, you know, especially their design group, you know, they brought in Peter Schreier. They made him a president of the company. Now they got Luke Donkervalka. They've got uh, Sang Yun uh, uh, Lee. They've got, uh, who's the guy that uh, we talked to? Oh, no, they just, uh, uh, Sean, who is that guy uh, that we reported on? Lowsby? Yeah, Lowsby. So they've got all these Europeans running all their design. Now, uh, I believe Munoz is Spanish. Uh, I Spain, think yeah. he could go really high in the organization. I think he, he, he's got to prove himself in this new position as COO Hyundai uh, Americas. I wouldn't be surprised to see this guy ended up uh, working in Korea hmm. and maybe being COO of the whole shebang, Hyundai Kia. Here's a, here's a fun fact. He's got a Ph.D. in nuclear engineering. So well, a smart guy. I, 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 but I think what, what's, what's interesting about, about Hyundai uh, Kia is how well they know the American market. Um, and, and right down to granular things like they, they call their, on the Kia side, they call their, their Kia muscle car a stinger. Very American name. They call their Kia Telluride. A three-row SUV, family SUV, a Telluride. You know, they're they're, uh, and, and the and Kia uh, version is the the Palisade, Hyundai Santa, the Hyundai, yeah, Hyundai, Hyundai, Hyundai Santa Fe. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, they're they're 
they, they know you can make a lot of money in this market. They know that Toyota is really smart in understanding Americans. Honda is the same way. I mean, I think Honda is, a, is much more successful in this market than they are in J Japan. These aren't Asian companies coming in and imposing their way on America. They're coming in and they're understanding this market and making mar products that, that, uh, that work in this market. And uh, Munoz, you know, ran Nissan uh, in North America. He knows this market, and I think that's consistent with what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to have to wrap this up. Two things. Bill Kerr wrote in to say he would buy an EF-150. <laughs> so there are buyers out there. And Ryan Huber wrote in to say uh, uh, how much he really likes autopilot. He says it makes you so observant. You observe how bad everybody else is driving. <laughs> um, and by the way, too, uh, uh, me, Katie, and Carmen ran out today and played around with the autopilot on this Model 3 that I'm driving. So check it out on our YouTube channel if you want to see uh, what we've done about this Model 3 so far. We've got uh, several videos. I think we've got another one yet coming, too. So check it out yeah, if you want great. to see what it's all about. Yeah. Well, with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Henry, great having you here. Yeah, Always thanks. is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Good to see yeah. you, Gary. And Gary, a lot of fun to do this show with you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Thank you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv. Okay, we're still live for those who are still here. Hey, that video I just told you about will not go up until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll be on uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and uh, I think we'll have it on our website as well, but we'll definitely get it up on social media. I, I, the, uh, to the uh, caller's question, I, 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 it really does make you aware. Uh, he, he, he says it makes him aware of how poor other drivers are. Yeah. It makes me aware of, of, of how many things we do intuitively as human beings when we drive. I mean, initially, when I drove autopilot, I, 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 um, I, I, I'm, I'm hyper aware that the car can't see what's on the road, can't see potholes, which is a real yeah, problem right. this time of year. So I'm, I'm constantly looking for potholes because I know the car is just going to hit them if, if uh, <laughs> you know, if, if one comes along. But also just uh, uh, stuff that's in the road, you know. I mean, you, you really have to be another I, set of I eyes. I like for autopilot in the sense that I feel like I gotta pay more attention. Right. Because I gotta be monitoring the car that's trying to drive exactly. instead of me just driving it. That's right. But, but, but over time, as I use it more and more, it, there, there are intuitive things that bug me about it. And I, and I know this is what they're doing. They're using our data. Everything you and I are doing is yeah. going back to the mothership, and they're right. and they're they're plugging it into the machine learning, and and uh, and the neural network is learning. But but little things like I'm driving along, and um, and I've been driving next to a guy in the left hand lane. I, I kind of know what he what he's doing, and you know, I've learned him a little bit, so that when I'm coming along and say, oh, there's my exit, I know intuitively to to brake or to accelerate around this guy to get to that exit. Because they're guys, you know, if you've been traveling with them, you know, if one, when I hit the gas, he's gonna hit the gas, right? They're just those little intuitive things as a driver. The car doesn't know that. The car does one thing. The car, the car drives up, it's time to get off and exit, I'm gonna brake and pull around that guy. To, to that point, in, in, in the, if, if you watch in the um, proceedings that they did um, at Tesla, when the guy's explaining how they're teaching the neural net to learn about things and, and yep. issues like that, yep. they're teaching it. And, and, yep. and it was also interesting how he points out that, you know, rather than just getting a dump of information from your car and your car and all the other hundreds of thousands of Teslas out there, that basically what they're doing is they're saying, okay, show us a situation where 
we're going to try to get off at an exit and the guy's sitting in the right-hand lane and we know he's going to do something and they get all those examples dumped in. Yeah. And, and to the issue of, of potholes, that this is another thing that they're, they're learning what they are, you know, and they made a point that a LIDAR can't tell the difference between a plastic bag and a tire. And they're gonna teach the system what a plastic bag is and what a tire is from millions of examples. And that's a lot to teach. And 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 they, but you know, you look. I mean, the numbers that these guys are talking. I mean, the, these teraflop operations per second. It's just like, it, it, <laughs> it's 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 mind-boggling. Well, it's got more learning to do because today I was driving this Model Three on autopilot. I was coming up to my exit. The turn signal automatically goes on, yep. and a little uh, uh, information sentence comes up and says, you know, we're going to get off at this exit. But there was a car on my right hand side, mm -hmm. and. So it's got the turn signal and it's waiting for this guy to go past. Well, he doesn't go past. Exactly. And then in, precisely the scenario. Right. I was talking so about. then the Tesla started to accelerate to go around him and he accelerated. Yeah. Then the Tesla braked and I don't know if this guy was messing with me or it was just an idiot driver. I think it was just an idiot driver. And then finally it it just accelerated and, and got over in the lane and got off at the exit. Mm -hmm. But it was yeah, I didn't I sat there and let it go through this because I was very curious what's going to happen. Right. But I wasn't comfortable with the situation at all. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's nervy. <laughs> it's really nervy. <laughs> yeah, and you and you, um, uh, you know, you get off of, uh, and, and all this will get better over time. But but uh, you know, you get off of cloverleaf. So a year ago, I couldn't do a cloverleaf in a Model S that I had out in California. Now I can do cloverleafs. Mm -hmm. And when but, you buy that seven thousand dollar upgrade for your system, Henry, you're going to be able to do. <laughs> I'll be able to do clover leaf at seventy miles now. Yeah, <laughs> but I but I think that's uh, what, in in talking to the couple engineers I know in development. What's what's really hard is the transition. I mean, if you if you put all autonomous car, if you if you geofence an area, if if you're London, and this may happen somewhere in China, if 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 China says okay, Shanghai. Uh, only has driverless cars. Then they're all talking to each other, and these 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 uh, uh, situations are very predictable. There will be no idiot drivers. But as long as you have humans and and machines together, it's 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 unpredictable. Yeah. Good. Well, hey, good show, guys. Thanks.